This is CHSR 97.9 FM here in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. This is Python's Paradise, your film and music show, and this is your host, Greg Gilbert, a.k.a. the Python Hyena. And folks, I grew up with Benji, and I was so honored last year, on this day actually last year, exactly a year ago today, I had its director, Joe Camp, on the show, and he was a wonderful guest, talked about Benji, uh, Devil McGuffin, Oh Heavenly Dog, and all the films that he did. Well, he is known for Benji, and Benji celebrating 45 years, and Devil McGuffin celebrating 40. Folks, I bring back the wonderfully awesome director of those films, Joe Camp. How do you do, Joe? Hey, Greg, how are you? It's great to be back. It is wonderful to have On you. On the same day yet. I, how did you pull that off? You know what? I just, like, I got everything uh, on the computer, like the dates I've done the interviews and what number they were and this and that. And I was like, wow. <laughs> I, I, thought, I, I didn't even uh, intentionally pull that off. It was just like when I went home, I was like, wow, I got it exactly a year after on the day. That is amazing. It is. We'll have to slot that open for next year too. <laughs> I did. I did. It doesn't seem like it's been a year since we talked. So that's the other side of it. Yeah. Well, here's a, my big, big question uh, from last interview: Has your wife allowed you to get an elephant yet? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <but laughs> believe it or not, we watched a movie that is. I. I think it's Netflix, and I can't pull up the name of it, but it's a new movie, one of those... No, it's Amazon, Amazon Original. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was all about this, uh, this lady whose kid leaves the nest and goes off to college, and the husband says, you know, I don't love you anymore, and, you know, has no life whatsoever, and she winds up going on a one of these safari trips down in... No, she had made uh, anniversary uh, reservations down on this trip to Africa, and she just said she's going to take it anyway and go on her, on her own. Mm -hmm. And because she's now without a husband or kids in school and whatnot, so she does. And she winds up at this elephant sanctuary down there. Mm -hmm. And just started my heart beating all over again. <laughs> and the whole thing was about this baby that had been, the poachers had killed the mama. And they had to, they were on the way to the place. The the guy, uh, Rob Lowe is the guy, and he uh, sees the baby elephant. He's an expert on all that stuff. And, and so they have to get a truck over and, and get the baby back where they can, do formula and give it by, and so she falls in love with the place and the elephant and the whole thing and winds up at the end of the movie uh, coming back to it. But it's just elephants wall to wall for uh, about two thirds of the movie or three quarters of the movie, and I just loved it. And this baby was just so cute. And it, uh, you know, they are such. I mean. Horses are, you know, precious animals, but the elephants are, you know, I think elephants probably beat the horses in terms of what they know about you from the minute you walk in the door and mm -hmm. how they can communicate and so forth. And it was just really cute. They'd, they'd walk, they'd go off on walks together, the, the lady and this baby, and they'd do it holding hands, you know, with the, tr <laughs> the yeah. baby would reach out with the trunk and grab her hand, and, and they'd just go along swinging like they were. <laughs> They were holding hands. But, yes, I no, she has not let me get one. <laughs> but she had the, the whole battle again just I know, was last week, I guess, when we saw this thing. And uh, and I said, oh, she said, no, we're not going, go, not going back there. I said, <laughs> and it's just thankful there's a there's a uh, an elephant sanctuary in Hoganwall, Tennessee, which is about 30 miles, 40 miles from where we live. But they, it's, it's a place, it's a rescue sanctuary with a specialty on you know, zoo and circus elephants that have led really pretty 
lousy lives up until the point that they're rescued and pulled away. And so they're letting them live in the wild without any human contact whatsoever. And I personally think that's not a good strategy. But the point of me bringing it up was that, that you know, I would have been down there years ago. Mm -hmm. You could actually go in amongst the elephants and be there and see them, touch them, talk to them, and all of that. And uh, but they don't. So, so the, I, I look at our horses, and I, yeah. and I, I say the horses. You know, people ask the question, "Don't you think the horse would be better off in the wild than it is right here?" That's the way it's grown up, the way it's supposed to live. Mm -hmm. It's living like it is, like they do in the wild, right here, uh, because that's our philosophy. But is it better? I I can't answer that. You'd almost have to ask the horse that because the horse it's, it's kind of like graduating from kindergarten to you know first grade and second grade. You know the horse has been exposed to things here. You know human contact and uh, human contact who loves them and teaches them with positive you know reinforcement and, and so forth. And so they're able to to grasp and learn and 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 do things that they would never have the opportunity to do in the wild. And as long as they're not in bad hands that are, uh, you know, harming them and using negative reinforcement in the training processes and so forth, uh, I would I would guess that they're certainly as as happy and possibly happier if you could if you could make a direct comp you know, comparison because you know in the wild they run around all day and run from predators and look for food and look for water and guard each other while they take naps and that's about it you know that's and well the stallions do their thing mm -hmm. but but uh you know here there's a, there's all kind of theme and variation to their life, and they certainly have a they have a greater knowledge base mm -hmm. because they all they they all have vocabularies. They all understand both point gestures and verbal language uh, and attitude. You know, of, you know how important this particular phrase is to me when I say it, <laughs> and uh, so I. I you know, I don't know. I think that uh, uh, I think the elephants should be allowed. To, you know, e even the worst circus situation. You know that there were people around there mm -hmm. who loved the elephant and cared for the elephant mm -hmm. and, and liked to be around the elephant, and there were relationships there. Mm -hmm. And and I don't think forcing them to never physically see or be around a human again so that they could live like they did when they were in the wild. It would probably take them the next 40 years just to remember how that was. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. You have totally enough... off the subject. <laughs> Axa, I was going to ask, uh, did you have enough uh, hay and stuff around for them to eat if you got one? Uh, not as it is right now, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, Kathleen... You know, always gives me that reminder and the other one, and that's cool, you know. Because elephants can eat a lot. Amount, you have an enormous <laughs> amount of poop to clean up when all that hay came out. Yep. And because you got to have two, you can't have one. Yep. They yeah. they, they run in pairs, and, and it's like horses. You can't. You, you should not own just one horse that has to live an isolated life. You know, to give them at least one or two others that they can commiserate with, and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, an elephant can pick a crop clean, so... <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, you'd have your hands full there. Yeah, and it's it's also on, on a hill, and I've never seen, and you know, all the, the wild shots I've seen of elephants are, you know, out on the, whatever you call it in... in, in the savannah, yeah. Africa, but it's you know it's it's always flat or you know it it worse some gentle risings, but it's not ever steep. 
our property is pretty steep, which is good for the horses, but it may not be good for elephants. No. <laughs> so how hard did you beg your wife on this one and lose out? <laughs> I, I didn't because I didn't really want to fight. <laughs> but it's, uh, I look at that like, okay, she's my savior in this argument because you know I have no business getting a couple of elephants, particularly Phil grown ones, holy moly. <laughs> and the, uh, it's not that it, there's going to be a whole lot of care worries, probably not, but it's going to be very expensive. Yeah. I a lot it. of work. Yeah. To, I mean, like right now, you know, it's, the ones that are in the sanctuary close by here have got to be eating nothing but hay. We were, we're down in the 20s still. Actually, we're not going over freezing today. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, uh, you know, that, that means that there's no grass, and uh, so you got to do the hay thing. It's one thing for seven horses, but a couple of elephants, I'm sure, can out-eat seven horses in yeah. heartbeat, so. You know, I've watched them uh, footage at a zoo. You know what they give elephants for a treat? What? Jelly beans. Jelly beans? Yeah. <laughs> I would have to do some research on that. Yeah, they they love the jelly beans, I'll tell you well, that. I'm sure, you know, the horses like cubes of sugar, too, but you shouldn't give it to them because that's, sugar is not something. You know, pretty much you can go down the rung of things that, that humans shouldn't eat, mm -hmm. and it follows that horses shouldn't either. Uh, doubt that elephants are too far away from that that thing. But too much sugar at any point in anything living is mm -hmm. no good. I watched them one time too for a treat. They what they feed hippos was watermelon. Huh? <laughs> yeah. That was, uh, it was, uh, some of this uh, footage that is... Can't be no, that can't be natural in their diet. I mean, they're species of, of Africa, too, aren't they? Yeah. Well, I don't think it's an everyday thing. I think it's something that every once in a while they give them a treat or something like that. Do they grow watermelons in Africa? No, this was an American zoo, I guess. Oh. oh. Yeah, I was just kind of watching some zoo footage, and I saw this, you know, and... <laughs> But uh, I don't think it's something they feed them every day, but I think, you know, it was one of those little things they gave a treat. So uh, it was fun watching hippopotamus uh, take that watermelon and just uh, mash that thing. <laughs> In one swallow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They seem to like it. <laughs> you, you, How many horses do you have? Seven. Seven. Three of them are out of the wild. Okay. Well, actually... Not right. Two of them are out of the wild, and she was pregnant. One of them was pregnant, mm -hmm. and had her baby here. Okay. So it was it was, con it was conceived in the wild, and mom was in the wild, and dad was in the wild, and uh, she has never seen the wild, but she's a Mustang. What's it like uh, having to deliver that kid? <laughs> to, ha having to what? Deliver that. Uh, the uh, the fowl, the baby. Yeah. Oh, uh, it was Mama's deal. I didn't do anything. Oh, I I don't know. I've never seen this done before. I didn't know whether you had to be there because it was your horse or whatever or what. So. No, and okay. uh, uh, we we did this once before when we were in California. Okay. Uh, the other Mustang that we have was a mare that was pregnant when we got her from the BLM. And she had her baby, and it was a boy, and it was the best baby that you've ever seen. Uh, he's he's on the website in the, the area of Meet Our Horses, I think is the headline, and then there's drop down menu and so forth. And, uh, and, and he was just fantastic, and it on his three-month birthday, he a 
big storm came through, mm-hmm. and, and he wound up freaking out, looking for Mama, and was looking one way and running another way, apparently, and ran headlong into a post and snapped his brain stem and died right on the spot. Oh. And it was like losing a, you know, one of your own. It was just, it was awful. But uh, she, you know, the BLM said she's going to have her baby, you know, probably in May, and she had it May the third. I mean, March the third. So she was she was early, and we just went down there one day, and there he was. <laughs> and the same thing was true with uh, Firestorm, which was Miss Saffron's baby. And we went, went back and down there, and I had to send a, a note to Kathleen because I went down, and she had she she had already left. She's teaching at the Webb School, which is a high-end preparatory school mm-hmm. in Bell Buckle, Tennessee, believe it or not. And so it's five minutes from our doorstep to commute. As an attorney, she used to commute an hour and a half out in California mm-hmm. to get to her her law firm. But anyway, she had already gone, and I went down to feed, and there she was. <laughs> and probably my best guess is that she had had it earlier. Uh, you know, three or four o'clock is what we had guessed on uh, the first one morning. And, and she was pinned up in a paddock and a side shed of the barn and so the baby must have been in there when uh and that's where that's where the birth took place because that's where the the uh the bag and placenta and all were and and so i don't know i mean it could have been in between but i doubt it i i I suspect when i got down there the baby was you know i I won't she wasn't as wobbly as i saw Okay. The you know she was still, you know, a little bit unsure, but so I guess she was probably five six hours old when I got down there. So I just took a picture of the two of them together and sent it to Kathleen and said, "Why didn't you tell me?" She had a coronary right there on the spot. Oh no, we have a baby and I didn't even see it. So she (laughs) she got her whole class together and went down and grabbed the keys bus and uh, you know a little van type bus and took her class which was about 15 students said come on we're going on a field trip (laughs) (laughs) and she came back home to to see the baby and uh, the only horse that we have that I we know everything about you know because all the other ones were not born to us. Okay. And there were experiences in their life, some good, some bad, you know, that we don't really have the facts or all the facts mm-hmm. on and so we have no clue, you know, what you know, what their first nine, ten years, eighteen years in one case. Okay. We're all about. So it's good. I mean I like that. I mean I like knowing that She was there, mm-hmm. licking on my hand. <laughs> Couldn't be more than six hours old. And uh, in my lap on her second day, snoring. <laughs> Do you own any other animals? I got ten chickens. Okay. Two dogs and a cat. No, actually, we got two cats. We have a barn cat now that. Just showed up <laughs> one day and have no idea why or where it came from or what the deal was, and, but it, it you know it knew the word kitty, mm-hmm. so it had been somewhere in civilization, and it was you know the minute you started being nice to it, it was you know rubbing up against your leg and everything. So we just started feeding it. It's been there ever since, at least a year, maybe maybe more. 
Yeah, I have a cat. And, <laughs> and she looks just like her house cat, too, which is kind of mm-hmm. cute. Well, wow. I suppose your dogs look like Benji, right? <laughs> no, there's one that's kind of close, but one's an Australian Shepherd. Yeah. Oh, my parents had an Australian Shepherd. It just passed yeah, away this year, an though. Australian Terrier. So yeah. I don't. I've never been to Australia, so I don't know how that is. The Australian Terrier could be mistaken for being in the genre. Okay. A little smaller than Benji. Okay. But we also had the uh, you know the third Benji. Mm-hmm. With us until she was fifteen, I think. Yeah. Uh, so she was part of this group that we moved moved five dogs from California, and three of them had passed away. Mm-hmm. Wow. What's it feel like? Like Benji is celebrating its forty fifth anniversary this year, and you've done uh, I've. I don't know how many Benji movies you've done right off the top of my head, but you've done a you've done quite a number of them. Yeah, uh, I've done I've done uh, Piano Heavenly Dog. I've done five, and uh, then Brandon's done one. Mm-hmm. I've done my youngest son uh, wrote and directed the one that was released on Netflix in last year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. What's it like? Here we are, forty-five years later, and uh, Benji is, uh, from a filmmaking standpoint, <laughs> kind of defined you in uh, in cinema. How does that feel? Uh, well, good, I guess. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it is, uh, you know, when you can drop down on a street corner, almost anywhere in the free world, and say one word. And bring happy smiles and sparkle to the eyes Mm -hmm. you know it's it's you know you've you know you've had a worthwhile trip and uh it uh you know that that means a lot yeah to me and it and it's all because it's all good all the benji movies are about the same thing they're about hope and persistence yep and not giving up Mm -hmm. love and all good things to to teach kids uh, and parents, but and I, it's it it's not a uh, it's not really a, what you would call a kid movie, or and none of them were really kid movies. We we always said that we made movies for adults that kids yeah. would enjoy. Yeah, and. And we actually had in the first theatrical run of the first movie, we we had a two to one ratio of adults over kids in the audience nationwide. You know, I wish I wish that uh, they would start having that attitude with family films because I find there's, a, with the exception of Pixar and the Muppets, I find a lot of family films nowadays tend to talk down to adults. I like the idea of the, what you said there, make uh, films for adults that children can watch. I, I love that con- concept, and it's yeah. lacking a lot today with family films. You know, I, our musician, uh, composer, mm-hmm. the very first movie, mm-hmm. you know, I'd already given him the, the pep talk and we want something that can qualify for an Academy Award nomination. And, you know, a lot of the music in there is very, very important to the story because you have no words coming from the animals. Mm-hmm. And uh, and still, when he started doing the opening song yep. uh, for the movie, yep. it was coming out very kiddy. You know, that's... And he was having trouble getting that out of his, you know, out of his head. And I also asked him, you know, I said I would like to, even though this is a totally different feel of a song. It's an upbeat song. It, mm-hmm. 
greets the public for the first time. Yep. And I'd love for that melody to be strong enough to when we get down into the gut-wrenching, heart-pulling struggles of Benji and whatnot, and, and you're using it down there, that it's the same melody. You may not actually recognize it as such, but you something, you know, two levels down is making you that much more uh, accept, I mean, making the music that much better. Yes. Because it's, it's like something that you've heard before. And, uh, and, and he he was just striking out completely. And so I, I pulled the plug on him one day. I said, fine. I mean, he, he finally got out of the kid mode, but he was just not making it with a song that could go both ways mm -hmm. or a melody that could go both ways. And so we, you know, I, I finally took it away and said, all right, look, forget that, forget going both ways. Let's just get this opening song done, and then we'll worry about the, the love theme later. And, uh, and he said, okay. And, and literally within two days, he'd come in with a demo, and he said, what do you think of this for the opening song? And he played it, as, you know, just piano and his voice, I think. And I said, it's good. I like it. I like it. I think mm -hmm. I think we've got it. We need to flesh it up some and let me, let me see. But I think we've got it. He said, okay, listen to this. And he took the tape out and put another one in and punched it again. And it was a heart-wrenching number on the piano of the same melody, very slow and pulling. <laughs> you take away the, you know, the, the stress, and it came out immediately. <laughs> it was just amazing. Oh, nice. And, uh, and it's a great story, and uh, the song did get an Academy Award nomination and won the Golden Globe. Fantastic. That, that must have been a great experience uh, uh, for those uh, victories for you. Well, it, it, it good learning experience for sure because mm -hmm. when I asked God to, to give us a song that could get an Academy Award nomination you know I'm, I'm thinking that how much help is that going to be because here's an unknown director unknown dog unknown everything going out there trying to make a place in the world and, uh, and God answered if you had a song that was in the Academy Award at least people are going to sit up and say hey wait you know, it must be a real movie and and so of course that's what we got. We won the Golden Globe, then went to the Academy Awards, and, and uh, Towering Inferno, I think, was the one that, that won the best song that year. And so I said, okay, okay, I got it. Next time I'll ask for what I want. <laughs> I'll ask for the award. <laughs> and, uh, it was it was pretty funny, but it. Uh, uh, it was a great thing, and, and while we were promoting that in our L.A. run, uh, we also promoted Benji for an acting award because that was one of the concepts that we were trying to get across in all of our material, and it's not one that's really easy to do, that the dog is actually acting just like a human would yeah. have to act a part. And, you know, you're... you're, you're seeing the entire experience, the entire movie, through the heart and soul of this dog, through the eyes of the dog. It's mm -hmm. a big struggle is with the dog. The dog is a three-dimensional character, and the people are the props. Yeah. And nobody had ever done that before. And, you know, it was just, that's the way it was when we when we started out. And, and we were in, in, lived in Dallas, and we were shooting in Dallas and around in McKinney, Texas, and, Denton, Texas, and uh, the the uh, press, the media, you know, had probably over a year of us babbling, you know, because it was an initial, oh, wow, they're making a movie in, in, uh, in Dallas. And so there was an immediate hook there, and so they were following us pretty well and coming out and doing all this stuff and, and whatnot. And by the time the movie got to the the theater in Dallas, it was very well known, and the 
concept was very well known that this is that the dog is the three dimensional character, and the media got it right away. Mm-hmm. And, and so when they saw the movie, they wrote about that. They said, "Wow, this dog X," and we were getting reviews like that all over the country when we went into L.A. You know, this dog is acting better than most humans do. This dog needs an Oscar, and blah blah blah. And uh, and and so we we took a lot of those quotes and tongue-in-cheekedly ran Benchy for Best Actor Award when we were doing the promotion on the song. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, it did wonders for, you know, for, for us because when we played Los Angeles, we'd really only played about 10% of the country. And the following summer was going to be, we, we played Thanksgiving prior to the end of the year because you have to be in a theater in Los Angeles before the year is out to qualify for the Academy Award and Golden Globe. Mm-hmm. And so we just bit the bullet and went on and ran, uh, did all of Los Angeles once we got our marketing program down pat and uh, and then put it all to bed and did the next summer, the following summer, 1975. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> go. But it but it, it 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 really worked great because of the all the stuff in the trades that we were doing promotionally about Benji and Best Actor Award and acting is a better actor than any human blah blah blah. Uh people were seeing it in the business and suddenly we started getting Benji jokes on you know, on some of the sitcoms and the you know, Johnny Carson show. I mean he, he must have talked about Benji at least three times in the run-up to the full release in 1975. Mm-hmm. And the very first one, I recall, I was just, I was like, you know, the world was ours. We would have finally made it when uh, there was a show called the Red Fox Show. Okay. I think, if you know who Red Fox is, he was a comedian in those days, and he, uh, he, he walked into there and he lived with his family or his son or something. And yeah. when the son walked in and says, Hey, Dad, we're going to go out and see the movie. You want to go? He said, What you going to see? He says, Benji eats Godzilla. <laughs> 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 I just came unglued that we had, you know, and it was one of the top shows, you know, like top 10 probably in the, uh, ratings at that point in time. And, Anyway, it uh, it all paved the way because you know in Los Angeles, you know if it plays in Los Angeles, you assume it's played everywhere else, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it hadn't <laughs> played anywhere else for the most part. Yeah. But so all of that helped get us, you know, with a big bang, uh, you know, when we when we did in the summer of '75. Here's a question. Do you, because Benji, of course, is celebrating, uh, of course, originally released in 74. You, um, it's celebrating its 45th anniversary. Have you been asked to do any of the conventions like Comic Con or anything with this? Because you'd think that, uh, Benji be a highlight with something like that. Well, I mean, Benji's never, you know, been a comic character or, Know, in any of that kind of media. So. Yeah, but there's a lot of movies that aren't necessarily comic book that they bring people in to do the cons with, you know, especially with anniversaries. Because, uh, I mean, I know that you got the two uh, children, the kidnapped children, uh, they're still with us, and uh, and um, various others. I, th- I, th- I would have thought that would be cool to, to have one of the cons uh bring you guys in for a panel or something, you know, and uh, meet the fans? Well, it's, uh, uh, for whatever reason, it hasn't happened. <laughs> and it's, uh, uh, and, and I don't, I really don't know why. You know, I, I'm not familiar with, I mean, I know they go on, but I'm not familiar with what they do and what they, you know, they don't do with, 
you're probably a lot more familiar with that than I am. But one of the things, though, like if, if, if you was at one of those things, you could sell a copy of your books and you could sign them and and, and stuff like that. And um, sometimes it just uh, overwhelms me if some of the films get forgotten at these cons because I'm like, like I'm certainly remembering Benji because I grew up with it, you know. <laughs> That's why I have you on here uh, because, you know, I grew up with your film. There's a, a lot of nostalgia memories there. So um, I I don't know they I I think they really need to get their butts in gear on that one. But and, uh, mm-hmm. well, just go after them. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. But um, out of all the Benji films, do you have a favorite? Uh, favorite is. That word can mean a lot of different things. You know? <laughs> Just an emotional favorite, obviously, the first one. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, it, it's not nearly as well made from a production standpoint as the second one or the third one or the fourth one. But, uh, you know, that's, that's the one that most people... Yeah, but you know what? I, I'm going to add something here. You you made up for the smaller budget by having some great locations, like just having Benji go around that house and uh, out that window and along those panels. And I always loved watching him do that, you know, and go through the neighborhood. You can add a lot to a movie, in especially a small budget movie by having interesting locations and uh, interesting places. Like he goes around the neighborhood, uh, the person that uh, the grocer gives him the bone or the woman's cat that he chases and, you know, and and stuff like that adds to it. And, of course, the house itself is nice and ominous where the, where the, uh, the, the kidnappers are hiding out. And, you know, he's got that little place under that chair he hides there and, but I always loved watching him go up through that little broken glass window, you know, and just go around. I think that yeah. adds a lot to your film. That that uh, I mean, you're right, and that's one of the things that that we have that, that we started with that film, and yeah, you know, it's the same exact reason that the uh, the second one was shot in Greece, mm-hmm. basically in in the Plaka area, the old town mm-hmm. of. Athens, a few monuments here and there, but uh, most of it is really texture and color and just really a nice place to be. You know, you get tired of looking at the dog. <laughs> and so, <laughs> it, but that house, the interesting thing is the original story that I wrote, the treatment mm-hmm. that I wrote on this movie, it was inner city. Okay. You know, scuzzy alleys and basements and you know, stuff like that. And, you know, something similar in that, uh, you know, there was a broken window in a basement and a few boxes stacked up there that he could climb up on and get out and in and that sort of thing. Uh, because it was, that's all, the, you know, the, the stuff that he does, the intention is to to soak up the audience in, in how clever and creative this dog is and how his brain works so that when the time comes for you know you, you to really believe that he can do this and do that and get something done you, you're you know you're already on the train so to speak and and we were at the same time that we were beginning to scout locations on the movie the original movie we were also looking for a house out north of Dallas, and that we could, you know, redo, so to speak, over time, do a, you know, a, a renovate uh, kind of thing, and that you could pick up inexpensively, and then, you know, over time, you could you know, paint here and take that wall down, put this wall up, and do whatever, whatever, and wind up with a really nice house. And so we were scouring around McKinney, Texas, which is a, pretty much a Victorian town. All the all the home sites mm-hmm. uh, are 
in McKinney. And in fact, the the uh, home of the kids is three different houses. Okay. One from the front, one from the back, and the third one for the interior. Okay. And uh, so it, you know, it really served our purpose as well. But while we're driving around McKinney, we stumbled on that house, and we were looking for it. Say, well, that that might be the kind of thing that we, you know, that we could pick up inexpensively and renovate. And so we went around it, and 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 there were you know open doors and broken windows and all kind of stuff. So we had trouble getting in it, and it looked just like it looked. I mean that's the way it looked, in the, the, and in real life, <clears throat> with the exception of that that arbor in the back that the dog climbed up, you know that was added to it. But the rest of the house, everything you see is what was there. Is the house still and, there? And and we and it's now a bed and breakfast. You know, okay. Last I last I heard of it, that's what it was doing. Okay. And but I, you know, we were looking for for our for something for us. And so we went through it, and da 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 That's pretty neat. And I would, took down the number or found a sign or something. I don't remember now exactly how we did it. And we're in the car driving home. And McKinney is, we were living in North Dallas at the time. And mm-hmm. so it's about, I don't know, 30 mile drive or so from McKinney to Texas. And we were on the freeway and driving along. And looked over, and Carolyn says, You know what? That old house would make a great home for Benji. And I really never got over how bad I felt because, I mean, I just almost took her head off. Oh, no, no, this is an inner city story. I, she couldn't do that. It's, it's, that's a whole different ball game, but it wouldn't work. <laughs> yeah. And you know, then I got to thinking about it. And about the third exit down, you know, I just kind of eased off the freeway and went out and said, what are you doing? Where are you going? Well, it's not going to hurt us to go back up and take a look at it again with that in mind. <laughs> <laughs> now, finally, you know, at some point when we were in the house, you know, put my arms around her and I said, thank you. This is going to be great. Yep. Then Just she contacted. By the time we got to somebody, the house had already been sold. Mm-hmm. It had been sold. Somebody wanted to do just what we were going to do. They were going to move into it and, and start renovating it. Okay. And... I begged and pleaded and gave him our whole thing. And you know, I said, we just, you know, and he finally said, okay, how long? Probably three months. Uh, and he said, all right, we can put everything off for that. And we made it just an incredible deal. I mean, I don't remember what it was, but it was nothing. You know, that he he took virtually nothing to, you know, like a grand a month or something to completely own the house. Mm-hmm. So that we had our production offices uh, in the house. We had the editing room was upstairs. And, you know, we, we really used, when you go back and look at it, just a few places, you know, the room downstairs, the room next to that, the, the stairway, the bedroom that he would go in and out of when going, you know, out somewhere. And the rest of the house was all been, you know, there were, dressing rooms, and all kind of stuff that we needed. And so we didn't have to buy or rent any of that stuff. And we did, the house was our home for the whole shoot. And, and it was there, ready to shoot in any time we had bad weather. Which yeah. Another plus, because a lot of times, you know, you don't, you, your, your cover set is in the next town or the next state you know, over mm-hmm. here that if you're going to jump inside when it starts raining – and start shooting something inside, you don't have anything unless you're on the stage or, you know, that sort of thing. And so that was always there for us. And any time we got, you know, shut down from being outside, we just go back in and keep shooting what it was we were shooting there. And cause the dog was always there. The trainers were always there. The actors were always there. They, they were run of the movie. And I bet the oh. owner of that place now loves the fact that Benji was shot there. Yeah, I would guess. I haven't yeah. been back in it or talked to those people. I don't know if it's the same people or not. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think it is, probably, because the, the first incarnation I saw of it after they you know, got in it and restored it and painted the outside and so forth, 
you know, I did, uh, part of me that was just cringing. I said, oh, it looks like a real house now. I don't know. Well, that's, and, it's um, interesting because the Texas Chainsaw Massacre came out the same year as Benji, and they turned that house into a bed and breakfast, uh, from what I understand as well. So it's interesting that Benji, the same thing, and uh, sometimes it's a great tourist attraction to not only see the location, but go in and, and, uh, and uh, uh, have it for a bed and breakfast, you know. I, I think that was a, it's a great idea for the location. Yeah, and, it, you know, if it were I, and I, I, it was my bed and breakfast, you know, I would, I would have that in the uh, uh, DVD player all the time mm -hmm. <laughs> when people were staying there and you know because it's you know when you go someplace like that I, i'm the same way you know I'll, oh is this the room that that took place in I, we're staying in that room wow you know? yeah <laughs> it uh it's fun and it's funny because Car carolyn is not that way at all okay it's a business <laughs> she was you know she was not enamored by stars, sets, or anything, and I always have been. Okay. Same here, yep. Taking e even walking on to a, a, a set, mm -hmm. not ours. Ours is always a workplace to me. But just walking on somebody else's set, I go, Joe 3, my oldest son, is a, a, a first AD, mm -hmm. and has done huge pictures. He's done a lot of work in New Orleans and Atlanta, both of which are fairly close to us. And so when he's there, occasionally we'll go down for a couple of days. Or he actually got me to come down for a week in New Orleans on uh, uh, Reese Witherspoon. Sweet Home Alabama? Huh? Was it Sweet Home Alabama, Reese Witherspoon? No, really, no it was oh, theoretically in Texas, but it was being shot in New Orleans. Okay. And... Uh, the uh, what is the name of that stupid thing? <laughs> the outlaw thing was being chased and whatnot. It was okay. It wasn't all that great a movie. But anyway, he said, "Why don't you come down? We got a whole series of things we're going to do next week on a on a bus, and you can come down and be a stunt man." I said, "I." You know how old I am. I'm not going to come down and be a stunt man and break <laughs> something. No, it's not going to be a big deal. It's just a bus that's going to be shaking around because they're driving it through ditches and all this kind of stuff. And Reese Witherspoon and uh, uh, I can't bring up her name, Hispanic girl. has got a TV. Oh, I think I know what one you're um, – oh, Oh, I'm trying to think of her name. She's on Modern Family. Yeah, maybe I don't know. Guerrero, Guerrero, or the original name of the movie was "Don't Mess with Texas," and so I've never been able to remember <laughs> what they changed it to because that was they found out that that was a you know, trademarked thing belonging to the state of Texas. They use it in their pick up your litter campaigns. But uh, anyway, so I went down for a week and, and was a stuntman on this bus with a bunch of real stuntmen mm -hmm. and all these old guys from you know Hollywood telling tales. It was like being back on Homps again. You know, <laughs> you know all the actors that were in Homps. You know, slim Pickens. <laughs> old heads, yeah, Slim Pickens and Denver Pyle and Cannonball and mm -hmm. you know just a whole there must be six or seven of them that were in these roles that they always play in westerns and whatnot and it was such fun just to sit around and listen to them talk about the old days or whatever and, mm -hmm. and tell tales and tell stories and so forth and it was it was uh, kind of like that with this whole group of stunt guys who were really I mean, there, there weren't any stunts, in, and I was in that bus for a week, <laughs> getting paid, you know, <laughs> scale for a stunt guy, which is the same thing as it is for a day player, and listening to these tales of the the real stunt guys and getting 
to know them and talking to them about all that stuff, and it was really it was it was a lot of fun, and it, it showed very well why the industry is got to be shaken up somewhere along the line mm-hmm. because you know every time you go into uh, i think it was 10 hour days and if you go you know one second over 10 hours it goes into time and a half or something and at some point it goes into double time and then if you don't have a break from the time that you wrapped until the time it starts the next day that is long enough and then i don't forget what the period is then you the next day, the whole day is at double time or something. <laughs> it, is, it was just insane, you know. Because I, you know, a few thousand dollars, you know, two three thousand dollars is what I was going to make, you know, for the week. But it was, I also fell over Father's Day and it'd be the first time that he and I were together on Father's Day for you know, a long time, and so it was a fun week. But I came home with three times that much money. <laughs> Because of all the overages and <laughs> non, you know, time and a half and double times and so forth and so on, and it's just insane that you know it can jump that high for. And I didn't do anything. You know, I was there. I was. <laughs> I'm in the film. You know, one or two shots. Do you ever see but, the the two children that uh, were in Benji? Uh, you ever see them since? No, I haven't seen Alan, the kid, the boy kid, uh, ever. And but I've talked to Cindy okay. a lot. Uh, I mean, I would say a lot, but you know, over forty years, you know, at least five or six times, that something will happen on Facebook or email or something, and we'll chat and how's it going, what's happening, and blah 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 blah, and so forth. Neither one of them followed up. But none of them were made any effort that I'm aware of to act in other things. So. I should reach out to her and see if she'll come on here. I think that that would be interesting to hear her stories. I, I'm sorry, you were breaking up right there. I couldn't. I was going to say I should reach out to her and see if I can get her on here, hear yeah, her story. Yeah, yeah, I might do that. That and, would. Uh, she still is in Dallas as far as I know. Okay. And uh, I can I can probably dig out the last email address I had for her and send it to you if you were mine. Sure, sure. I, but it's probably, you know, 10 years old, so I don't know if it's <laughs> still the same or not. Well, I'll, I'll see. I'll see. I'll send you an email about it. But, you know, it's, you know, Benji celebrating 45 years and Double MacGuffin, your follow-up film, um, well, of course, you had your Benji, uh, you had your Benji in Greece there already, but you did have uh, the Double MacGuffin in 1979. That is celebrating 40 years. It's interesting because when I watched Double MacGuffin, by the way, I enjoyed it. And uh, it's I, in- I do too. I, I we watch it every five years or so, just for lack of something that's well, he- fun and wholesome. And and I always enjoy it. I haven't I haven't reached a point of not enjoying it. Well, uh, here's what I find interesting: you take um, something that's very light, like Benji or these kids. And you put them in a very, very dark environment. And I'm not like, talking physically dark, but just in the circumstances that they're in, you know. And, and uh, you have some really good uh, uh, humorous moments in Devil McGuffin, just like Benji. And you got some real dark moments, of course, because they, they, these kids find a body, you know. And then you, there's a severed hand in there, you know. And, and stuff like that could be really, really dark. But uh, this movie is also really fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and yeah, you... I, I, I uh, and that's that's one of the ones that I've set out to do a caper movie because I've always, you know, the uh, the sting mm-hmm. you know, has always been one of my 
favorite capers, but I love a good caper movie, and and that's what I wanted <laughs> to do. It, the mistake in that movie is that we started out saying, okay, we've got three adults, and we're going to go out and go for it, because remember, this is this is actually the fourth movie, and and so we had certainly a, a, an accumulation uh, from from Benji and for the love of Benji and uh, Humps. Mm-hmm. I don't think added anything into the bank account at all. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it it went. You know, it, it was great in certain parts of the country, and that took us to saying, "Okay, we got another winner," and we went up to New York and all that area and spent a fortune and it, you know grossed a dollar and a quarter or something. <laughs> but uh off the point, you know, you know, Orange are you supposed to keep me That's okay. Orange. We're good on time. <laughs> We're good on but time. The the uh the that being the fourth movie and I don't uh, what 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 the plan was was to hire five great kids that nobody's or six Mm -hmm. that nobody's ever uh, seen before probably but really do a good job I mean do a really thorough casting job and have personalities that were really going to mix well and be different and and all of that and then the adult parts we were going to go out and pay a bundle of money to really strong box office marquee value people yeah like uh, George Kennedy Ernest Borgnine yeah but Elk those, Summers. those are all second layer people yeah and what happened was is we get the script to all these folks and I've forgotten uh well John V. F. Bujol or somebody like that was was really hot back then, and we were going to try and get her for the Elky Summer role, and we were going to try and get uh, you know a big star for the Kennedy role and a big star for the Ernest Borgnine role. I mean, big marquee value stars, uh, and none of them. I mean, I think every one of them came back and said, "I think it's a great script," but you know. <laughs> You know the old saying about kids and dogs: just don't do it. It's going to be the kid's picture, and that's not good for my career, kind of thing. And so that's we wound up. If any of them are listening, I <laughs> they all did great work. Mm-hmm. Joe, but George Kennedy and Ernest Borgnine and uh, Elky Summer were not marquee people at that time. They were. Sub, you know, in the in the the B class or whatever, and they weren't going to make him make or break a movie one way or the other. Uh, and so, it's in that sense, the movie probably should have never been made. But by the time we got to that point, we were already up to our ears in in you know, the fan, getting the financing worked out and spending money for you know location scouting and all this kind of stuff. And so I just wouldn't let myself say that, you know, we couldn't overcome the fact that we didn't have, you know, A-plus list stars in the movie if we made a really good movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was wrong. <laughs> well, I love that opening shot with the, the ladder coming out the window with the, you know, the rope ladder. And, you know, they're climbing out. And, of course, you see the eyes peer out through the blinds and... It's like, you know, they're going to get reported. and <laughs> But I love the dynamic of these uh, kids just kind of uh, uh, running out there in that opening shot there and running across there into the dark darkness there just so they can go down there and uh, play in the water. <laughs> and, and it was like below freezing. Oh, gee. The night that we shot that, too. I mean, it was terrible out there <laughs> it wasn't a good time for anybody so they you know the, the performances they turned in were particularly when they were sopping wet and just 
drying off with a towel like this was a summer play day or something. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, I, 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 I like that movie a lot. I really do. And it, uh, how did you see it? Did you get a DVD of it? Uh, no, I. it's actually online. Is it streaming? Yeah. Um, is that movie out on Blu-ray yet? Because that's how I get my movies. I can't imagine. No. No, I can't imagine it being on Blu-ray. Because I did enjoy We control the distribution on it, and as nothing has happened with it. And you know, we put it in every package that we do with Benji movies and things like that, which is currently, you know, Mill Creek is doing the uh, DVD and Blu-ray stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I think I told you last year that you know the the original Benji and for the love of Benji mm-hmm. and the Christmas ABC special yeah. have all been completely remastered. You know, back to the original negative, widescreen, high definition. They look great. All three of those look. Just they need super to get great. Oh Heavenly Dog and uh, Devil McGovern. They wouldn't pay for it. I mean, they, the, the, they could. Ne- it wouldn't make the money back. You know, just, for a while, there was kind of a cult double MacGuffin group out there. You know, in the early days. Mm-hmm. But they, it's not a way to earn them. It, they, each one of those cost a bloody fortune. And what what we did with Mill Creek is they paid for it but they are allowed to add it to the advance that we got and recoup it. And so we agreed to that. And they were about twenty five grand a piece to do that with. Oh wow. Well here's something that I did notice in the film I did want to bring up. Um <laughs> you know when um I think it's Billy Ray, the the cowboy looking kid mm-hmm. is following the villains. And I notice at one point he's grabs a book and the and he's kind of flipping through it, kind of make himself look anonymous. And I notice there's a couple of Benji books on the thing. Was that planned? Oh yeah. <laughs> I did notice that. I was like, ah. <laughs> and probably none of those books would be on a stand in a hotel of that quality, but nonetheless, it, they were there. Yeah, we. We snuck that little opportunity in, and, but you reminded me of one of the shots in that kid. Mm-hmm. You know, and I've had conversation with that kid since. Okay. And I love him to death. I hated him so bad I couldn't stand it because his his audition was the best he would ever be. And we do a lot of things, you know. We don't we don't do much, you know. Shoot wide and cover. Mm-hmm. We shoot long winded shots that go from wide to close to back and medium, and and are more interesting, I think, than you know, cut from a wide shot to a close up and close up of the other person and then back to the wide shot. Mm-hmm. So it the that. That shot in that hotel, if you go back and look at it again, yeah, is one long shot. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, there are cuts in the sequence, but I've forgotten now, but from where he, I think it's from where he sees the guy, I said, oh, i got to go get out of the limelight here, and goes over to the thing and idly picks up a book and looks down at it, and we, and we get in really close on him and the book and, see the Benji books and everything there mm-hmm. and uh, and I think he goes over there to, to no he, he he read a note he had to go yep. open a note or something mm-hmm. he picked up okay and is it, oh the Ernest had thrown away That's yep and so he goes over and picks it up comes back over to the thing does look at the note oh wow and then sees Ernie walk in, and he's got to bury his head in the book, and it, it, it goes on forever. This is a long shot, and there's a lot of stuff in it, mm-hmm. and it was so difficult to get him 
through that whole shot. I was actually thinking of breaking it up into a lot of little pieces before it was over with. And and there are places in that movie where the entire stream of dialogue was from take two delicately laid in and snipped here and there to take four or whatever. <laughs> because he looked good in this one, but he sounded terrible. And over here, he sounded great, but he blew a walk or something. Okay. And so by the time we got to the end of the movie, I was ready to kill him. I really was. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, the rest of them were all all good. I mean, what you see is what you got. Mm-hmm. They were all, they, they all you know, did their thing. The hardest part of any of the rest of them was teaching the little kid how to flip the knife like oh yeah he came out with a with a flip flip on it made him look really handy with it mhm and he's he wasn't at least the most coordinated thing in the world but he did learn it okay bring it off really well but but Billy Ray just oh my gosh and so i after the uh, when Carolyn died, I don't think I'd talked to him okay. for years after that. And uh, after Carolyn died, the week after Carolyn died, we were living in, in uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina at the time. Mm-hmm. I received a letter from him. And I can't really even try to read it to you without breaking down. But he, he called. Yeah. Shortly after the movie, he called Carolyn mm-hmm. and told her. He said, "I don't know if she ever told you that I had called or not, but and he, he told her that that you know it was one of the great experiences of his life, and it proved to him that he could accomplish anything that he wanted to accomplish. Acting wasn't going to be it, thankfully for everybody." He said. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he said, "But but that gave me more confidence and blah 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 and." And he said, I just think the world of both of y'all, and I'm so sorry that this happened. Yeah. Yeah. You know. And I wrote him back, and we went back and forth for, for a while. But he yeah. he turned out he's, uh, he's a lawyer in Lubbock, Texas. <laughs> mm-hmm. And doing well. One person I do want to bring up is uh, Lisa Welchel, who... Of course, you know she went on to do Facts of Life. She was cute as a button. Did uh, did uh, some Christian albums as well. I remember that song, "Good Girl," and um, she, uh, of course, was in Double MacGuffin. How did she come into this? Was it from the Mickey Mouse Club? I think so. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think it. Did. And she lived in Dallas. Mm-hmm. I believe. Yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking. I'm pretty sure that she lived in Dallas at the time. And and I think it, you know, it was that combination of, of somebody who lived close and we could interview without going out and spend a bunch of time in California and that sort of mm-hmm. thing. And uh, it, she's the only one who had ever done anything. And I think that the Mickey Mouse Club was all that she had done up to that point. Yeah. Oh, she grew into a, a a gorgeous young woman. I'll tell you that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen pictures. I, I, I saw her out in L.A. at one point. For somehow we got some reason we we got reconnected, and she was out there shooting something or living out there, probably mm-hmm. at, at that by that time, as she was doing the series. And she called and asked if. We, that she was going up to somewhere in northern, you know, north of L.A., where they do gliders. Okay. She went up to take glider lessons. Okay. Well, she was in Survivor, I believe, so. Huh? I believe she was in Survivor, I think. Really? Yeah. I saw some pictures of her uh, online there on the Internet Movie Database that pertain to that, so. I, I guess you can do that physical stuff. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I said, "Are you crazy? What are you doing?" <laughs> and we got together that time. I don't. It wasn't out by the glider place. I'm sure, but uh, I, I remember that we did have lunch together or something, and just talked and caught up and whatnot. But 
it was uh, it was a good group of kids, and uh, I, I, I don't know whatever happened to Dion. You know, he he had a great voice, and you know, I expected him to follow his dad through the music world, but you know, I haven't ever heard anything that he's done since. Yeah. And I loved how they brought the kid and the glasses into it as well, and and uh, and uh, he ended up kind of gelling into the group reluctantly, but ends up becoming part of the group. Yeah, yeah, I enjoyed that. And, and he was uh, he was twenty one years old. Oh, was he? Oh, yeah. <laughs> he didn't look it. No, I I I think I was astounded. I don't think I even knew how old he was when we hired him, and. And I think I was astounded when I found out he was 21. <laughs> what about Lori Lively? Huh? So what about Lori Lively, who played Michelle Carter? I, I don't. I, I'm sorry, I'm not hearing your question. Lori Lively, who played Michelle Carter. Uh. She was cast as Laura Lori Lynn Lively in the movie. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I, I I'm you know, I'm totally lost. I can't I don't know what I'm missing there, but it uh Okay. Well you the da- it's the daughter of of uh of uh Elke Summer, right? Mm. Is who you're talking about? Uh yeah, I believe so. Okay. Yeah. And then we have uh course elky summer and you got george kennedy and you got ernest borgnine you know the uh, they may not have been the big stars but i'm gonna tell you they were definitely effective casting yeah they i mean i, I loved working with all of them and uh and particularly george uh, and ernie just stories on both of them but ernie uh george came by, he was shooting something in Atlanta mm-hmm. years later, and somehow, you know, there'd been some press thing on it or something, and so Carolyn went and found, you know, the production office for the shoots that they were on, found out how to get a hold of him, and he called her back and said, I'm throwing a birthday party for <laughs> yep. uh, for for Joe, and out at this place, and there's any chance you could, you know, fly over for it. I know that's asking a lot, but he'd be mm-hmm. tickled to death to see you and blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And he did. Actually, he was finishing, and he was on the way home, and he just broke up the flight and got off a plane, came to dinner, talked for a while, got back on the plane, went on out to L.A. Mm-hmm. So it was very nice. And... and uh, Ernest Borgnine kind of really reminded me what you did with uh, oh um, Omar Sharif in uh, Oh Heavenly Dog, one of those villains that's intimidating, but um, not too crass, you know. Yeah. You know what I'm getting at? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, that's just uh, I'm sure that's. You know, part of me directing the direction that they brought the character to, because I, you know, I've I've never even seen the alien. <laughs> I have not ever seen the alien, believe it or not, <laughs> and because I didn't want to. And you know, when you get really deep with the nasty and the ugly and everything, then it's not fun anymore. And so. To get to that point to be effective and still keep everything fun is the direction that we would always go anytime we got into one of those kind of spots. You know what? You brought in uh, Mr. Citizen Kane himself, Orson Welles, as the narrator. That must have been an interesting experience. That must have been what? An interesting experience. Uh, it wasn't all that much because it was done long distance. Oh, okay. You know, I mean, he, he agreed to do it, and we 
sit the thing. We had a conversation on the phone, and you know, it'd be like telling you know any of the great voices, you know, what to do if you if you dared to do that. And so I didn't I didn't have much to do with how good the recording actually was <laughs> because he mm-hmm. just did it and it was great. And then I never ever met him actually. Okay. Well he's, 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 at least well at least you got his uh name on your film. That's uh that's awesome. Borg uh Borgnine, just a short aside on him, when we when we won the Golden Globe, which, by the way, if you ever have the opportunity to go to either one of them, go to the Golden Globes. Okay. It's a whole lot more fun. The mm-hmm. party is be- in, is before. Then you eat dinner. Then they do the show and everybody goes home. Mm-hmm. So, so all the people who are, you know, now pissed because they lost the, you know, the uh, award, or at the parties at the at the Academy Award. Mm-hmm. Academy Award party is after the awards, and it was dull and it was boring. It was not much fun. Okay. And the, the Golden Globes earlier, a month or two earlier, uh, was just fantastic. It was a lot of fun, and ever and Benji became the one to get the picture taken with. You know, and we had just this whole battery of you know Doris Day and that ilk. <laughs> you know, it was there and was taking their pictures with with Benji and the, the photographers would always send us the contact sheets and we'd order photos so that we had Benji with every star in town and whatnot. And then our table yeah. was uh, uh, right at the edge of the stage. I guess you'd call it stage right, but it was, if you face it, it's on the left. Mm -hmm. And as each, and and that's where our table was, and there was about, you know, six or eight of us, our number one investor, and Frank and Juanita, Benji, and their investor's wife, and I don't know, there's about ten people at the table. And the people who were doing the presentations would come up and stand you know somebody was directing them so you go stand right there on the wing and they'll introduce you right after this one's over with kind of thing Mm -hmm. and so the the one to come was always standing right there basically next to our table and as it turned out we had decided at the table that if if it were possible for Yule to win. And I, I, I didn't think we were going to. I thought Towering Inferno was going to get this one. Okay. And I was right on the Academy Award. <laughs> but the, uh, Benji was kind of around, and because there was a railing right there, we were right at the edge of the stage and the drop down for the next tables to be seated. And there was a railing there, and, and Frank and Benji and Juanita... Uh, and Yule were all kind of up in that area where it's going to be hard to get out. And I was basically had my my chair, the back was to the stage diagonally. And so I had to get out of the way for for them to all unravel and get out quickly so that Yule could go up and carry Benji with him. Mm -hmm. And uh, when when I was stumbling backwards trying to get out of the way so that everybody would hurry, I stumbled into... Ernest Borgnine, <laughs> who was going up to, to do the award after hours, mm-hmm. and I and I, I didn't know who I just turned around to say I'm sorry, and I went ah, oh. <laughs> I dropped my mouth dropped, and I just pointed my finger and said ah, oh. <laughs> and he said he just grabbed my finger and shook his hand. He said congratulations, <laughs> and there was a look in his eye that you know. Because we were screaming and hollering. It's like a football game. You know, the whole table was unwinding. And <laughs> none of us expected to actually win it. And and you could see in his eyes, and I remember it vividly, that he could remember 
when it was all that important to him. Yeah. And however long after that, you know, when he won the gold, when he won the Academy Award for that first right. movie, I think. Yeah. Uh, and it was just there. It was just a moment, but it was it was a really sincere congratulations because of it is generating those kind of feelings for him. I think. And then years later, we uh, did a movie together. That and, that must have been awesome, yeah. And I, I asked him, you know, when I, when he came in to talk, he didn't come in to interview, but he did come in to talk and uh, talk about the film and so forth. And uh, uh, but he didn't. We weren't auditioning him or anything. But he, uh, I asked him if he remembered that. Yeah. And it kind of clicked, you know, like he hadn't, if you'd ask him to tell what happened that night. But when I told him about, you know, the timing and everything, and it uh, turned around, and he he did, he remembered the incident. Probably didn't remember who who it was that had fallen into him, but it was was a lot of fun (laughs) to then work with him after the fact. He's a great person, dude. He's a wonderful guy. Yeah. Well, hopefully, you know, we can uh, eventually get uh, Double MacGuffin and Oh Heavenly Dog on Blu-ray. You know, I, I personally, I think there is a market for it, but uh, I don't know how many movies I've seen on Blu-ray that I don't know why they're on Blu-ray. <laughs> you would think that these would have an opportunity, you know? So um, I, I don't get it. And uh, So, but... I have know. You seen, have you seen the 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 uh, remastered Benji? Uh, I have not yet. No. Nope. And the fourth, and for the love of Benji, both are just they just look great, and uh, they're on Blu-ray, both of them as well, and they're mm-hmm. streaming in HD and whatnot. But just seeing it in widescreen you know, knocks it out of the park for me because it was you know when you transferred for television back in those days mm-hmm. it was square yeah three by two or whatever and 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 so we the further we got you know from the original negative and all of that the more expensive it got to go back and start over when people started asking for hd and blu-ray and stuff like that mm-hmm. and so we had never done it until we made this deal with mill creek and they wanted to do it so that they would front the money but we'd have to pay it back in the earnings category. So and I was really glad that we did because they, they're really good looking. So now on Netflix, there's Brandon's Benji, mm-hmm. Benji, Benji off of the, I mean, uh, uh, for the love of Benji, the Christmas show, mm-hmm. and Benji off the leash, which goes back to your question about favorites. Mm-hmm. And that could be one of them. Each... Each one of them is is a favorite for a different reason, you know. Like even Benji the Hunted, mm-hmm. you know, there, there was something like three minutes of humans in that entire movie. And if you ever think you had trouble with actors, <laughs> <laughs> you get twelve trainers on a set. You know, one for the bear, and one for the wolf, and one for the cubs, and one for the hero cub, and one for the big cougar, and <laughs> oh my gosh! There were a lot of scenes that all, you know, several different of those animals were in mm-hmm. at one time, you know, one way or the other, and and so it was really incredible. And it, everything we've ever done has been shot in roughly three months, mm-hmm. and that one took four. Oh wow! And we trimmed down to, and we, you know, we have when we when you're doing it independently when you're you know raising the money independently you got a but you got a finite budget and that's it and there's not any more there's not a studio back there saying oh well okay here's some more money <laughs> but it uh so we had to make it work and so we we trimmed down to virtually nothing i think we had 12 14 people <laughs> or something in the last four weeks of the thing 
doing it and had all kinds of weather problems, of course, in Oregon and Washington. Mm-hmm. When the, uh, the the head of the Oregon Film Commission came out, he's uh, one of those Hollywood <laughs> talk show things. Yeah. It was coming up, I forget which one. You know, come up and shoot and do some interviews and whatnot. And he ran over to me and said, Please don't talk about the weather. Don't talk about how bad the weather is. <laughs> and the day they were on the set, it was pouring down rain. <laughs> oh, the day. <laughs> I said, I didn't have to talk about it. There it is. <laughs> Was there was there much cut from these movies? Like you see a lot of these Blu-rays and whatnot come with uh, either uncut or deleted scenes. Was there much of that? No, we haven't done any of that. Okay. Yeah, we we've, we've done the uh, uh, yeah, and, and, and usually I don't know what the I I don't know what the the motive is there, other than the fact that it's a director who wanted it to be four hours long and <laughs> the studio wouldn't let him or had to cut something out because of the rating or something like that and mm-hmm. go back to the true thing. But, you know, when we finally walk away from it, when I finally walk away from it, we've pretty much done the best we could do. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to pick up anything by going back and adding scenes or anything like that. We did, you know, on, on this, this new release, there... There is a uh, 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 what do you call it? The comments by the director. Oh, commentary. Yeah, commentary. Those are always fun. Myself. Yeah. They're with Brandon and myself mm-hmm. on Benji and for the love of Benji on the whole movie, and he's he's really good. He's a good questioner. Uh, he did a good job because that basic, basically was his role. Well, what about this? How's that? Those are always my favorite, are the commentary tracks. Well, they really, yeah, and, and the fact that it's running over the movie yep. you know, is, is, is good. And, and the, we did make sure that if there was some gaps where we weren't actually talking, you know, that the soundtrack came up a little bit so that mm-hmm. it wasn't sounding like, what, what was he saying? <laughs> <clears throat> but, but they were fun to do, and we did, I, I couldn't believe it. We did both of them in one take. Oh, nice. Nice. Didn't go back and pick up anything. We didn't go back and say, "Well, I wish I said that." Or any. We started and went all the way through one time, and on each one of the movies, and that was it. That's what's there. But it, but it's it's pretty good. And then on 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 Benji off the leash, mm-hmm. Margaret Lesh. I don't know if you know who she is, but she's has been a big name in the. She ran the Fox Kids family when it came out the gate. Okay. And it's been on several kid oriented things. She was with Hanna Barbera for a while and whatnot when we did the, the Benji series. Benji Zacks and the Alien Prince. Oh my god, I can't <laughs> <laughs> that that's what cured me of television. <laughs> <laughs> uh but uh she was working for Hanna Barbera at that point and they were one of our partners on it and uh and so she's there, the uh, editor, Dave uh, uh, Whithouse, uh, who just recently won an award for Best New Documentary Director Okay. Uh, on Bathtubs Over Broadway. I don't know if you've heard about it, but it's great. You ought to see it. It's, it's all about these gigantic stage shows back in, certain periods of time that they would put on at Ford conventions and, mm-hmm. you know, general foods conventions and things like that to highlight their products and make something. They're all musicals and whatnot. For the, you know, they bring in all the sales team and the customers, I guess, and whatever, and rent a real theater, you know, and go down and blow these things out. And so it's, it's, a, it's a background story on how all that came to be and how some of those people particularly the, the composers and the writers and so forth, were making three times the money that they would have been making if they were doing movie work, real mm-hmm. movie work. But anyway, she she edited uh, uh, and boy, what stamina she's got because to put up with me for that long under those conditions, <laughs> just holy moly. 
mm-hmm. and uh, and the and the composer. So it's the composer, the editor, Margaret, who was one of the producers, and, and me, four of us, that did the commentary on Benji Alpha Leach, mm-hmm. which is there in its own room. You know, that's the unfortunate thing about the streaming is you don't get any of that stuff. No, no. Unless no. you do a whole real deal behind the scenes, you know, like they did with, you know, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy and Jungle Book and yeah, that sort of thing. And those were great. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I watched the one after Guardians of the Galaxy every time I watched the movie, which we that's three hours or better <laughs> for the whole lot because it's on uh, on Amazon's version of of that, and so is Jungle Book. Jungle Book one is great too. Mm-hmm. And watching these two directors work, I just love it. I love it. I, you know, I just want to you know suck them into my blood because they are they are really my kind of people, and the way they go about it, and the way they reach for emotion. And, situations where there just isn't any like Jungle Book. Holy moly, have you ever seen the way they shot that thing? Yeah. I mean, there was nothing there except a tree log and a green screen. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the kid is acting all the time to some idiot in a clown suit or something. <laughs> <laughs> There's no, uh, you know, and, and it's so real. I mean, when you reach out and touch the face I'm a wolf. You see the fur, the fingers in the fur. It's just such amazing work that they're doing with that sort of stuff now. Yeah. Well, anyway. you know, speaking of amazing work, I I know that uh, maybe I'm alone in this. But I loved Oh Heavenly Dog, and I'm still hoping that uh, they'll put that out on Blu-ray. And um, you, well, you well, go do one of those. Uh, Fundraisers, you know, those <laughs> things that you can sign up and say, we want to do Blu-ray and on you know, these two movies, and it's you know, yep. cost somewhere probably like fifty grand, and you raise the money, and <laughs> we'll get them done. <laughs> then you can tell us how we're going to peddle them. <laughs> oh, gee, I enjoyed How Heavenly Dog. Have you seen Chevy Chase since How Heavenly Dog? Have I seen him since? Yeah, like I've like since you've. Uh, uh, Worked with no, him on he, the. He, he, he hated the movie. Oh. I do know that. I mean, I heard that and I've read some stuff about it. He said it's the worst experience he ever had. He just wished he hadn't done it and blah, blah, blah. Uh-huh. And, uh, it's, it, the shame of it all is that what we, what we wanted in the beginning was Burt Reynolds. Yeah, I know. You've mentioned he, that before and that Burt Reynolds wanted to do it and. Yeah, and, only yeah. after we'd already made the deal with Chevy Chase. And I just said, oh, man. But, and and I don't think he would have ever said that one way or the other. He would have just played it and had fun and mm-hmm. gone on. Yeah. Uh-huh. But anyway, it's, I, uh, that's the least of my favorites, though. Wow, oh, Heavenly Dog? Yeah. It's my favorite. <laughs> Well, that's good. I'm glad. It's my I, favorite. <laughs> I, I ran into a guy who was CEO of a theater chain up and down the East Coast mm-hmm. whose favorite movie was Homps. Okay. And Homps is the only film that we've never been able to get on network television because at ABC, when we sold the first package, I said, just put it in there. You don't have to raise the money and just put it in there. You're going to have a time somewhere when you're up against the Super Bowl on another network and you're going to have to have something to play. No, it's a terrible movie. I hate it and I'm not going to. And there, and this guy, it was his favorite movie of all time, is the CEO of this. And they called and said his, birth, his retirement party is coming up. Could we have a print to play for him? <laughs> Surprise. Because that's his favorite movie of all time. And I said, you can not only have a print, I will put bows on it and wrap it (laughs) and (laughs) send it over, and he can keep it. (laughs) Because very few people, everybody either was on that side of the fence or the other side of the fence. There was no middle ground on homes. And I suspect that the the old heavenly dog sort of that way, too. I don't know. We watched it within the last couple of years, and it, it... 
yeah. from a, a standpoint of what I wanted it to be and what it turned out to be, it's at the bottom of my list. It did not, it did not hold me. It didn't move me. It didn't, you know, very few times. I mean, I can't watch <clears throat> Benji or For the Love of Benji or, or uh, Benji Off the Leash now without choking up several times through the movie Mm -hmm. where I'm supposed to. (laughs) And that's, you know, in my way of speaking, I can't do it. I can't get it any better than that. If it's still moving me to the point that I choke up, of course, I'm an easy cry, but. Well, you go to what Omar Sharif uh, really brought it in that movie is because when he looks at Benji and uh, he suspects uh, something with Benji but can't put his finger on it, his reaction is so great because any other movie, they would have had the villain overact and be a buffoon. He really played it straight, and I thought, I thought, what great casting! Omar Sharif uh, was so good in the movie, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was, and he, and he was a great guy. He's, he's really an interesting guy to talk to. I mean, he had a brain, you know, not like some actors that just that's the whole life. But it, he was really interesting to sit and talk to, and, and we did a lot of that when he was when he was on set. Did I tell you what? What we did with Doctor Doctor Zhivago? Uh, you might have refreshed my memory. After dailies one night when we were shooting mm-hmm. uh, somewhere mm-hmm. uh, in Canada, I guess, and and I had had them go out and get a print of Doctor Zhivago mm-hmm. and not tell him, and so after dailies. Don't anybody leave. We got a special movie. If you want to, if you want to see it, you're welcome to. And I got to sit right next to uh, to uh, Omar Sharif watching Doctor Zhivago. <laughs> <laughs> that is that that's pretty darn cool, you know. Yeah. And uh, and I and I spent a lot of time, go, you know, glancing over at him. He just grinning like a Cheshire cat. Oh, nice, nice. Did well, he, that I may have told you that story because I usually don't get into that without telling you the, the story about uh, uh, Zhivago and David Lean? No, I don't think I heard that. Da- David Lean did not allow actors to go in and watch dailies because it's out of context and he didn't want them to start judging their selves on okay. something that, you know. So <clears throat> people were coming out of this movie of the uh, dailies, you know, just praising everybody in the world, Julie Christie and, uh, you know, the other people that were in the movie, mm-hmm. and never saying anything about him. And he was having sleepless nights, and about to have a nervous breakdown, he said. And he said, finally, he called Lean about midnight one night, and he said, I can't, I can't sleep, but I can't go another night like this. i got to come talk to you. And he went over and talked to him and just spilled it all over the place. Nobody's talking about me. Nobody's. Everybody's talking about everybody else, and I f- must be doing a terrible job. And Lean went through this whole thing, and they were up until you know three or four o'clock in the morning. But Lean went through this whole thing. He says, "You have to trust me on this. You are a poet. A poet observes. Mm-hmm. You are in every scene. You may not have as many lines as somebody else has, but." When they walk out of this movie, you're the one that's going to be on the tip of their tongue. Promise you that. And he won and, the Oscar. And yeah, and and he and he's got. I've forgotten. I counted them one time or something. You know, like forty-three lines in the whole movie. <laughs> you know? uh. I mean, very. I mean, it's, it's probably more than that. But uh, it, when you when you watch it with that in mind, it's astounding. I mean, it's amazing is that that uh, he knew so much. But he said he, he said he he was he said he got better, but he didn't get a whole lot better because it was still the same thing. Nobody was giving him praise, but he was always there with those eyes, mm-hmm. and that's what triggered me. You were talking about his eyes. Oh yeah, and, she, and and he's 
and he's really, really good. Well, I really enjoy Hill Heavenly Dog, and we're coming down to your your two hours here, and I know you wanted to <laughs> to uh, get out uh, be, before too much time passed, and yep. I'm going to honor that for you. I would love to have you come back on here next year for the 40th anniversary of Oh Heavenly Dog. Sure. Yeah, because you know what? Well, you know what? I don't think you hear enough good things about that movie. And I'm, one of the things I remember when I interviewed you last year and we talked about Oh Heavenly Dog, I was talking about why I liked the film. I didn't just say I liked it. I told you why I liked it. And I could just kind of sense your reaction <laughs> as I said it. Because I th- I think you appreciated it. I'm not trying to pat myself in the back here, but I think you appreciate it because you don't hear it so much. But it's always nice, even on films that you have on what you consider the bottom of the list, have somebody say, wow, I love this movie, and here's the things I really enjoyed about it. And I mentioned the music and the, the settings and all this stuff, and I went into detail. And uh, that was one of my favorite parts of the interview was the fact that I could, I could sense your reaction. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, where, where I sensed your reaction there. So, um. well, that uh, uh, I do still appreciate that. Mm-hmm. I, I, the mo- the movie, you know, from a standpoint of success, was doomed probably from the beginning. You know, we thought we were we were naive enough to think that we could take Chevy Chase's audience and Benji's audience and merge them together and have a one plus one equals three kind of situation. Mm -hmm. But it certainly didn't happen. And the way it started out with Burt Reynolds, it would have been much closer to that. You know, Chevy was the Saturday Night Live guy and pretty well known for, you know, dope and whatnot. And, uh, although none of that ever showed up on the set Mm -hmm. that I'm aware of. He was a very, very good guy to work with, and that all worked, but it's just, you know, the audiences are so complete. You know, I think the Benji audience thought we were had copped out, and the uh, uh, Chevy audience probably thought he copped out. (laughs) And I don't know, it's just... The, the promotional mix didn't work. And that was the, the big issue. I mean, I, I don't, I never disliked the movie. It's just, and I think maybe the lack of success about it, because we were, we were pretty, I won't say taken with ourselves, but, you know, three of the first four Benji movies were in the top 10% of box office for the year. Mm-hmm. And that's pretty outstanding. Yep. And and you know we just go from one to the other and say we're gonna we got to keep doing this we got to keep make, making these things doing them well doing them blah blah blah, mm-hmm. blah. and uh, sure enough you know there's I don't know if that did that tell you about the book God God only knows I don't think so. Yeah, there's there is a book. It went out briefly, self-published, mm-hmm. but it is now being readied for uh, distribution by HarperCollins Christian Publishing. Okay. And it's called God Only Knows. Uh, can you trust him with the secret? And the bulk of the book is the Benji story. Okay. What it took to get to that point, and then what it took to get through that point, mm-hmm. and <clears throat> then to go out to Hollywood and have every distributor in town turn it down, and how I thought, you know, the, these were the most devastating times in my life. You know, this, you know, I wanted to go to UCLA and it was turned down, and do this movie and. Everybody loves it, and we take it out for distribution, and nobody wants it. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and we were sitting back to Dallas with our hat in our hands and had two choices, you know, throw it in the trash or figure it out. And so we... You figured it out. <laughs> we went out and raised more money and sold off a whole lot more of the movie and formed a distribution company and figured it out. And it... Uh, you know, from from the, the moment that it was turned down by everybody in Hollywood, mm-hmm. one complete jerk at Paramount, and one really nice guy at Universal who was head of distribution at the time, mm-hmm. who said, this movie, if I could take this movie out myself, I guarantee you I could make it hit. Mm-hmm. But I can't guarantee you that my people out there in the field feel that way about it. And it's going to take somebody with, with that kind of passion and that kind of belief and they, who, who can take that much care with it to make sure that it happens like it's supposed to happen. And I suggest you go back and do it yourself, which is the last thing our chief investor wanted to hear. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but less than a year after that, mm-hmm. well, it wasn't less than a year about a year after that daily or weekly variety Mm -hmm. put on the front page that Benji was number three in the box office for the year there you go and uh, this is that book is the book that that uh, tells the story and if you'd like to have a copy of it Send me your your uh, snail mail, and I'll send you one. Oh yeah, absolutely. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Well, and it, it, it's going to come out from uh, uh, Harper Collins. The uh, the release date is uh, I think it's April twenty two, and that's the pre sale date, and then. The actual uh, availability date is, I think, May the 17th or something like that. I can send that back with you to to tell you. But it's, I think it's as good or better than any book that I've written. And I'm excited about it. Well, you know what? And as a a (laughs) Vinci fan, I think you'll... You'll love it for that reason, if for none other. Well, I, I'd love for you to sign it to when you send it. So, yeah, I'll send you my snail mail. I, I would be honored. Yeah, I will. I will do that. Just uh, drop it to me, and I will. Uh, I'll send it to you. And of course, next year. We're going to do the 40th anniversary of O Heavenly Dog, and I'll tell you why. I'll go through it again. I'll tell you why. It's a, uh, my favorite of uh, the Benji movies. <laughs> well, you you asked earlier, and then I need to wrap up. But the the favorite, the, the my favorite for all obvious reasons is the original. The original is it? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. The <clears throat> for the love of Benji, every time I watch it, I say, "Dang, <laughs> that's really good." Mm-hmm. It's really good, and I was really hung up between the two. You know, after it was made, after for the love of Benji was made, <clears throat> with the fact that I had misplaced the emotion that won everybody into. The original Benji, because in the original Benji, Benji was struggling like crazy. And basically, the story of of the original Benji is a dog struggling to accomplish something that dogs usually don't have the ability to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And that's saving the lives of two kids that he adores. Mm -hmm. He was doing something for somebody else. And in, for the love of Benji, he's doing something for himself.
himself, saving his own life. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's not as rich a an emotional stew as the other. So that's why. But I but after getting away from it for some time, you know, and coming back now and looking at it, we've seen it at least twice in the last three or four years. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the new version has a. Uh, as the commentary on it too with Joe and Brandon, but I, I really like it. I, and and I like Benji off the leash a mm -hmm. lot. Yeah, which is a totally you know around the clock different kind of movie than most of them have been. But we looked at that recently because Kathleen says I want to see my kids on the screen again. <laughs> And so we we watched that again because she and her twins mm -hmm. are uh, in the, one of the scenes with in the uh, cop's office. The, no, the the uh, humane society office where the uh, lady and the cop are good friends. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> in one of those scenes, they're, they're both him. So I like that one too, and I love Benji the Hunted because I don't think there's ever been a movie made with that many different real animals mm -hmm. and struggle with each other. Mm -hmm. And so, and I like Brandon's movie. So I don't, I don't dislike any of them. I just put Oh Heavenly Dog down the list a bit from an emotional attachment standpoint. It's, I think it's because <clears throat> it just didn't come out the way I had hoped it would mm -hmm. as an emotional device. Yeah. Well, you know what? It, it's been great talking to you again. And, yeah, we'll uh, I'll have you back on next year, and um, – I'd love to celebrate Oh Heavenly Dog's 40th anniversary. And uh, just like we celebrated Benji and uh, Double uh, MacGuffin today. And, uh, you know, this has been fun. But before I let you go, I was wondering if uh, you'd mind doing a plug for my show. Sure. Hi, this is Joe Camp. I'm the writer and director of all the Benji movies, and among others. And uh, uh, you're listening to Greg Gilbert. Python's Paradise, and it's a lot of fun. I appreciate uh, having you on here again, Joe. And um, like Is I that said, what you need? that was what I needed, yep. And um, I look forward to having you back on next year and celebrate uh, your films further, and uh, maybe you'll get your elephants <laughs> by then. <laughs> <laughs> Don't hold out on that. <laughs> my bluff were called on that, I don't know exactly what I'd do. If he came in one day and said, all right, you can have two elephants. <laughs> I would probably have a cardiac arrest or something <laughs> at the end of it. But anyway, I appreciate it. Thank you for doing it, and thank you for having me back, and uh, look forward to next year, and I will watch Oh Heavenly Dog before we go on the air. <laughs> Same here. I love that movie. I love it, and uh, I'll go into even further details why next year when I have you back. Great. Thanks so much, Greg. No problem. God bless you, and you have a wonderful day. You too. Yeah. Bye. Bye.